Hello everybody. Uh, today's video is going to be a bit about safety. Um, I guess there's a saying out there, it's uh, beyond the breakers. Um, I do that, but I kind of go probably a little bit off that in regards to, I would call it, beyond the side of land. Okay. So whenever you see me doing my offshore, at the minimum, trolling, doing the wreck fishing, um, that's kind of out there in the 10 to 15 mile out range. And once you get that 12 mile range, and, and, it, and it could be quite a bit less if depending on the weather, if it's overcast, if there's any kind of swells, but 10 to 12 miles is when you start losing sight of land. Uh, down here in the Keys, you have to remember, it's not like um, the other shoreline places like say Miami, Fort Lauderdale, or any other coastline where you have a lot of huge towers and resorts and uh, the big tall buildings there. In the Keys, I think three stories, two stories, three stories is about it. And that barely gets you over the mangrove line sometimes. So visibility is a, one of the bigger challenges here. But beyond that, I kind of wanted to go over um, the safety specific items that I carry on my kayak uh, beyond the fishing stuff, more just for that uh, safety aspect and to the extremes of when I do my far offshore trips, uh, maxed out with the safety stuff. And then of course, when I'm doing inshore closer, I scale it back, but it's always some sort of variant. So anyways, check it out. Let's start from the back and work our way forward. So. In the back, we've got the rudder. Um, one of the important aspects is knowing how that rudder works um, and how to repair it. So the things that you have are four different rudder lines, which are very important for steering. Uh, but then you also have the rudder pin, which is basically a plastic shear pin. So if there's excessive force on the rudder, that is what's going to break. And you basically definitely need to know how to repair that pin as well as being able to uh, repair these uh, rudder lines if necessary. And I do have a video about uh, repairing those, but just how they are rooted, how they work are very important. Now in the Hobies on the rear hatch, they actually have a spot for keeping a shear pin for that rudder in the back in case you break it off. So there's one here and there's also one in the mid catch. Um, I actually broke my rudder pin the last video when I was out jumping in an um, offshore trip. So I'm down to the one, so I probably need to pick up one spare, but in general one is enough because you're not going to be breaking them all the time. Uh, I do have my transducer in the back, but uh, safety wise not too much of an issue there. The GPS on fish finder slash GPS's tend to be in the head unit, so it's not a matter of if there's a problem with the transducer, the GPS part won't work. Next up is my safety flag and light, as you can see there. Now on my light, I've actually modified it, which I think is actually a better design. Uh, before it was a pressure sensitive, so as you tightened it, it would uh, tighten on the connectors and that would set the light up. But the contacts would constantly rust out and there were just these shoddy little light units. So what I did is I ended up uh, making it with a regular flashlight, you see there. And what that does is it still gives the, uh, the brightness, the light, but it also does is that I can take it out and then use it as a directional signal light if necessary. So I think this design is actually better. Plus this is waterproof inside of a waterproof case. So the chances of it uh, not working are a lot less. And of course, we've got reflective, and then the flag itself is uh, visible, especially when you're in the waves offshore with the boats not always paying attention. Now, another safety item that you almost will pretty much always see me with when I'm going and doing the offshore stuff is my kill box, my death box there. Usually when you see that, that means I'm killing something. But also when I'm going offshore, this is an excellent uh, flotation device. So if you ever see um, shipwrecks and so forth, the thing that you see uh, out in the rubbish floating around is ice chests. Because in general, they're, they tend to be uh, waterproof um, and insulated. But what will happen with this one is I don't permanently mount it. So if it falls, if I flip or whatever, uh, this will just float out and it'll be just floating. I can go out and grab it. 
or if something happens or we just get totally separated, this gives me one more object that I could hold on to uh, beyond my normal PDF and other floating stuff. Um, one of the important things, if I'm going to be stranded out, uh, kayak sinks for whatever reason. Most likely the kayak itself isn't totally going to be submerged, but so it's not pad paddling, paddleable or movable. I could probably climb onto it, but if it's mostly submerged, the issue there does become the sharks in regards to um, them being interested in getting a little too close. So being able to get out of the water is a very important aspect of it. So as long as I have my PFD on, that keeps me afloat, but with my legs in the water, my body in the water, my movement, if I get cuts, if a small fish start biting you and creates blood, that can cause some problems there. However, staying close to the kayak, even though it's submerged, that'll get my main torso out of the water. Um, I could also use this to put my legs on top of to keep more parts of me out of the water and out of that uh, issue with the sharks. Okay, moving up, uh, a lot of times you'll see, I also use this as a riser for my seat to keep my butt out of the water, but also it's another flotation device. Um, it's off of a regular seat cushion for a boat, but works perfectly raises my butt off, keeps me dry, but again, another flotation device. I also run uh, these pool noodles inside the housing of my kayak for extra flotation, uh, just for the flotation for the kayak. Um, inside the Hobies, they do have supports made out of foam, closed cell foam as well, which will prevent it from totally sinking, um, but these will also take up some of that vacuumous uh, areas and add more flotation stability. Uh, the other thing, uh, a lot of times you'll notice that I'm wearing um, basically waterproof either uppers and lowers and these are just breathable waterproof, keeps me dry, keeps me warm and necessary. During the summertime the water temps are close to 90 degrees so hypothermia is not so much of an issue. What I do like about these is that in case I do get cut, um, they will make a good type of pressure bandage because they're basically waterproof but yet breathable. Other good use for this is that if you happen to get a hole or a crack or something in your kayak, uh, this stuff would be uh, good stuffing to plug those types of holes. What I also carry a lot is uh, general rope. Um, you'll always see me carrying uh, this strand here. Um, I primarily use it for tying off to mangroves or there's that pipe on the shark channel when I'm tarpon fishing but uh, other times this will come in handy if I need to get towed in, if I need to tow somebody else. Um, a big part of why I also have this for is to be used as a tourniquet in case I cut myself or get bitten or stabbed or something like that, is that I can use that to uh, prevent any or minimize uh, blood loss. Uh, a lot of times I'm gonna be pretty far away, so you gotta kinda help self-medicate yourself to survive. Uh, I also know that I've got my anchor trolley lines that I can cut. I've got my uh, support ropes for my rod holders, and bungee straps all over. So there's quite a few different pieces there, but just knowing where they are, what I could use with them is very important. Uh, so as a short-term bandage, tourniquet would be cutting off some cloth, putting it over the, we're talking larger cuts, bites and then uh, wrapping the rope around it to uh, pressure stop any bleeding. Almost always I'll have a plastic bags, whether I have it for bait or for keeping fish in or whatever, but I uh, always kind of like to keep a few plastic bags on my kayak as what they are good for is also uh, leak prevention, just like the waterproof clothing. clothing. Um, what I've used this in the past before on my uh, Wilderness System Tarpon 140 is that I ended up getting a leak in the um, scupper hole top part of it and water was just flooding in and I was going to sink but what I was able to do was to take a plastic bag, ball it up and basically block off that um, scupper hole making it like a plug and that prevented water from getting into that leak until I could get back so that really saved me from sinking. So that's another good use. Also again for uh, cuts and wounds and stuff like that, it's a good pressure bandage to just to stem the blood flow. Sort of a sidebar but still can be kind of important. I always keep uh, some mosquito repellent and uh, noceum repellent. So uh, 20 something percent uh, DEET percentage is uh, at the minimum. Uh, dengue fever and being totally uncomfortable is very important to have this. 
I also run my fish finder, but it's also a GPS. So that's very important just for general directionals and uh, knowing where you're at and knowing where you need to go to get back to land. Again, a lot of my stuff is focused for getting back to the side of land in order to know which direction to go. When you're out in the ocean and you have a 360 degree of just water and not knowing which way to paddle becomes very uh, risky. So knowing the direction to go is a, a very big part of my focus. But that's my primary use for uh, the fishing part of it, but that GPS, I will always get a GPS built into the unit and then I'll go other to some other safety equipment that also follows that. Now, one of the most important safety devices that I carry and would definitely be one of the top three turn around and go back if I forgot it type of thing is my pump, okay? Uh, being able to pump out water. Using a cup, using a sponge, using your shirt, scooping out with your hand will not suffice in an emergency when you have a problem of uh, water interdiction into your uh, kayak. It's just for general cosmetics and to soak up the, the loose scraps of water inside there, yeah, it's working. But when you're having water just injecting into your kayak and you need to recover it or sink, nothing will beat this, nothing. Probably, like I said, one of the most important safety aspects that I carry. So I almost always have that, unless I'm strictly doing inshore stuff where I just hop out and it's two feet deep or one foot deep and I just walk back to the dock. Then I don't tend to worry about it. But other than that, it's a must. I'll probably do a special, special video separately on this just to show how much water flow that you can pump out of that versus trying to get it out and into just a um, your uh, middle hatch or center hatch or front hatch. Uh, I've had it where I've forgotten to close one of my hatches and the water was just running in there and I didn't know it until it almost was to the point where I was going to sink because the middle hatch was going to start overflowing and uh, before it hit that uh, ridge I was able to grab this and pump it and beat the the water <laughs> and get it out before I sank so it does come in quite handy. Even if you're in a group, at least one person would have one. But if I was that group, I would be the sure the one that I've one that has it in case you get split up. Now in my front hatch, I keep a few things always a standby. Uh, one is I would carry a PFD. Um, that is just extra flotation, but it also comes in handy when I forget my main uh, fishing uh, life jacket. I can still go fishing because I know I have that one in there. So I would recommend that to anybody that has a kayak just to have that spare so you don't screw up. Um, the biggest way to get stopped and checked by a Coast Guard is not to have a visible uh, PFD that they can just glance and see and then they'll just ah whatever. But if they can look at your kayak while you're on there and they see no uh, PFD in sight, they'll oftentimes will stop and start checking and then check more things which can be a pain in the butt. Uh, the other thing that I'll have in here is a spare paddle, okay? Uh, not necessarily like if I'm going to be doing weeks and weeks of uh, inshore, no offshore, I'll take them out. But if I'm going to be doing any offshore stuff, I'll have this. Um, I'm fortunate that I'll have, with the Hobie, I've got the pedals. I have my regular paddle. I have my motor. And then this one is just a spare. If you do have a just a standard paddle kayak, I'd highly recommend having a spare paddle because you lose your uh, primary uh, engine source. That's not good. Um, hand paddling and using a, your uh, five gallon bucket lid, I've done that and it's a pain in the butt. Uh, another thing that I carry up here is my snorkel and mask. Uh, that's just will help for general recovery. If I need to do some damage assessment on the uh, kayak itself, Basically, if I have to get in the water, it's better to have a mask and snorkel on. Uh, it tends to make things a lot more comfortable and you don't get so tired out trying to keep your head above water. Um, your anchor gets stuck. Um, just drop things overboard. It just really comes in handy. So it doesn't take a lot of weight. So that's why I keep it in there. Okay, what we've got here is what I call my death prevention box. Uh, this is just all my safety gear I keep in a watertight box. 
Uh, again, a lot of this stuff is electronics and metal and salt water just kills everything. So uh, the best prevention on keeping your safety stuff working is you just gotta keep it out of that salt water. So I keep it in this dry box. What I've got here is all the small but important things that'll save my life if necessary. Um, well, probably the most important is this, which is the good old uh, VHF. And uh, I've gone through a few of these basically because of corrosion. I've lost batteries, antennas, um, salt water just corrodes everything. So my preference is, is I used to wear it, but I get so saturated. It was just constantly getting wet and then just killing these things. So rather than risk getting out there and then having it not working, I keep it in the dry box and I've had this one for years with no problems. Next, uh, another pair of electronics is, this is my spare, spare GPS. Um, I've actually got it hardwired to plug into my battery that powers the uh, GPS uh, fish finder. Uh, the reason why I'm not using a battery in here is because the connections for the battery in here died. So what I did is I hardwired uh, uh, wires to it with this port on it, and then so I could still use it. So in case my uh, fish finder GPS dies for whatever reason, I could still plug this into its place and still have the GPS to find out where I'm going. Next again with the, again I'm gonna go over is that um, the biggest risk that I have is of losing sight of land and uh, being able to get back. You have to remember I'm in 100 miles out in the ocean on an island. Um, yes, we are connected, but still it's just it's a hundred miles away from the mainland and it's just out in the middle of between two oceans. And uh, once you get beyond uh, visibility, you need to have the ability to know what direction to go in order to save yourself. Otherwise, you've got Cuba, Mexico, or uh, Texas. So uh, the th other directional that I've got is a standard compass and then this gives me always gives me north and then I could always go from there. Uh, emergency stuff is I have a basic compact uh, mirror, and that's for signaling during the day. Um, I have my flashlight. I keep a headlamp with my normal fishing gear, with a, which is a uh, SNR search and rescue style headlamp, so it's very good, waterproof, very dependable. I also have my light on my kayak flag, and then uh, like I showed you, is I've got that removable so I can use it as a directional, as well as how I have my cell phone light on there. And I do have the compass in the cell phone as well, as well as communications when it's uh, in cell range for the uh, calling for help. Uh, other safety equipment I've got is just this, which is basically some duct tape, and that is just a rolled up on a stick, and what that would be used for is to just doing a quick patch on a um, crack or something out with the kayak or to wrap something or if I got a wound, uh, put some cloth and then wrap it with the duct tape and that'll help fix some basic stuff. Uh, I keep a cutter with a razor blade style cutter. Um, this will be good for cutting stuff out of like a hook that's embedded in you if you can't pull it out and this will help you to cut the skin so you can either push the barb through or to pull it out easier. Um, I do have my normal knives, but for fine-tuned cutting, a uh, razor blade always works really well. Then because of uh, the motor, um, I run, I keep a spare spark plug, spark plug remover, and then a wrench for taking that off. Uh, of course, you've got the PFD. Um, on there, I've got my whistle. Got attached to my pliers as well. These come in handy, pull a hook out of yourself, or just having that on you for stuff is a, a pretty good thing to have. Uh, I also have my knife in a convenient position to be able to pull it if need be. Um, this is an NRS Chinook. Uh, it's one of the high back ones. Made for kayak fishing, but used for just general kayaking as well. Very comfortable, um, stays out of the way. 
Uh, I prefer a standard flotation device versus the inflatables, um, just based on the fact that the auto ones can be a little sketchy in case you fall overboard and it sets it off. Um, they're expensive and uh, anything that has any type of metal in it will corrode in salt water and I don't like to use that. So this is always there. Um, I get knocked out, I pass out for whatever reason, I go overboard. It's, I know guaranteed gonna keep my head afloat. And I also carry this uh, to ranch with the uh, pair of cords uh, tied around it. This is actually the uh, same cordage that I use for the pull start on the motor. So in case that line breaks or it gets sucked back into the motor, I have the wrench that will take the nuts off of the starter housing and then I can reattach a new line. Otherwise you're dead in the water. So that's all the hard safety equipment that I uh, utilize when doing the offshore style fishing. Um, hopefully that it was helpful to kind of explain all the different types of things that are available and their uses and maybe stuff that you might think about adding to your uh, safety supply list. Uh, I think maybe on a future video I'll also kind of do one uh, more about the little psychological side of uh, going offshore. Uh, there's really nothing like doing something and then looking up and uh, looking around doing a 360 and realizing that you have no clue where land is. That's always a good jump start for the day. Um, and as well as just kind of prepping for it mentally on uh, how to just kind of get yourself ready for a trip like that with a lot of things that can go wrong and just that fear factor part of it. I think some people might find that interesting. But uh, anyways, uh, hopefully you found that helpful. Um, maybe added a few things to your own safety list. Uh, I'll always add things as I find necessary, but uh, in general, this is my go-to uh, list that I stick with. So anyways, thank you for watching. Uh, again, hopefully it was helpful, and I'll see you next video. Bye.